And that's one thing I'm going to mention a little bit about is, is the possibility of trading these things. The other two indexes are explicitly designed from the get-go to be tradable indexes. Um, and they, they track different populations of properties in, different, different, in very different ways, right, as I, as I mentioned. Um, so these, these three uh, have already spawned what I would call sort of brother indices out there in, in the industry. Uh, in 2009, Green Street launched what they call their CPPI, uh, based on their um, NA, NAVs that they estimate for REIT uh, properties. And um, in 2010, COSTAR launched what they call their CCRSI, COSTAR Commercial Repeat Sale Index, which um, is very similar in methodology to uh, the methodology that we pioneered with, with uh, the Moody's Real CPPI, the, the repeat sale methodology. Uh, but uh, based on the CoStar database, which is interesting because CoStar tracks not only the larger institutional properties that are in this uh, $3 trillion uh, population of properties, more than 2.5 million that make up the CPPI, but CoStar goes all the way down to your mom and pop you know, gas station, uh, $150,000 property. Um, and it's fascinating to see in these CoStar indexes uh, how those smaller properties do perform differently than the institutional properties. Um, so I said, I mentioned that two of these indexes were explicitly designed to be tradable. This is a new idea in, in real estate. Um, the idea that you could write a contract that will pay off based on an index. And uh, essentially, like if it's a swap contract, uh, the contract would say, over the period of this contract, say the next two years, um, the, the party selling this contract will pay to the buyer of this contract um, the return on one of these indexes each month or each quarter, something like that. Um, and of course, uh, th th so that means the party that bought that contract is going to receive that index return. Obviously, the party that sold that contract is going to pay the index return. Uh, if the index return is negative, then the actual cash flow is going to go the other way around. So you can see how this would enable people to, for the first time in history, effectively and efficiently short real estate. Now, indexes track a market. They don't track individual properties. So what, what you can do is you can use this to synthetically invest in a market, a whole market, all at once, uh, without any transaction costs, without worrying about how have to actually buy properties and manage properties. In terms of the, the, the long side of that position, it's a synthetic investment in real estate very diversified. Um, in terms of the short side, it's a hedge, right? Y you can protect yourself against down movements in the market. And what this allows real estate people to do, if I define real estate people as people who have expertise in the bricks and mortar, in the actual properties, what you guys can do, I presume, is add value at that level, add value to individual properties or groups of properties or types of properties. And you want to be able to make money by adding value like that, whether the market is going down or up. Because you can't control the market, and that's not your fault, <laughs> right? That's not, you know. But you want to make money by what you can control, which is what you can do to the bricks and mortar. And that's what the program at MIT is, is really very heavily focused on. You know, it's a, it's a specialized master's degree in real estate, real estate development in particular, it's all about the bricks and mortar. It's all about real estate as a physical product. Uh, real estate at MIT is located in the School of Architecture and Planning rather than in the business school precisely because of that. So we like to think we're helping to train or, or, or learn from uh, people who are really dedicated to and able to add value in real estate as a physical product. Okay, this can enable you guys to hedge the market. So you don't need to now, you know, uh, lose a bunch of money out of because of stuff that's beyond your control, namely a market that's going down, you could hedge by taking the short position in a, in a contract like this. Um, that's the basic idea. And what I'm showing here is actually um, the contract that has been traded so far in the U.S. is the old traditional NACREF index. And you know it doesn't actually matter that much which index is used as the, the contract. Uh, all of these indexes are, are obviously kind of tied together. Uh, I'll show you that more in a minute. Um, and um, what I'm showing you here is how the pricing that was quoted for that index dramatically changed at the in the midst of the financial crisis. So this is from uh, uh, August 2008 to February 2009. Remember that period of time? 
that was that was one of the most uh, most horrifying periods of time in the history of the U.S. financial system, um, and you really see it here in these price quotes. Um, the index already by August 2008, things were looking pretty bleak uh, in commercial real estate, institutional real estate, and the index had already priced down to a price of negative 200 basis points. This was for the, I think, the most widely traded version, which was the two-year uh, index, the two-year contract. So this is saying that basically the, the market uh, for these contracts is thinking that that index, the NACUF index, is going to fall 200 basis points per year over the next two years. As of, that's what they thought, that's what the pricing was quoting as of August of 2008. It was down to about negative 300 basis points by October. And then, you know, Lehman and everything else, AIG, <laughs> and by, uh, you know, by December of 2008, it was down to essentially negative 1,000 basis points per year on a two-year contract. So, um, you know, just to see how exactly the mechanics of how this would work uh, is, is uh, explained in this slide here, which I'm not going to get into that much depth, but the essence of it is, actually I think that the better way to show it is, the essence of it is um, if you bought this, if you sold this index, so to hedge, you're going you're gonna to sell it, right? So you s if you sold it at, say, negative 300 uh, in October, um, by within a few months, by December or January, um, with that price down to negative 1,000, you would have made approximately $14 per $100 uh, that, that, that you traded um, because basically the contract is marked, it dropped seven points, 700 basis points. Uh, that's per year, and it's a two-year contract. So the contract uh, that was uh, traded at a straight-up zero, right, stra straight across the trade between the long and the short, traded at zero cash up front uh, at a negative 300 price in October, that contract on the short side would now be worth $14 uh, per, per $100 of notional that you traded. Uh, and of course, on the long side, just the opposite. Somebody who was betting on things turning around and going up, uh, they would have lost $14. You could have liquefied that by either selling the contract then in, um, you know, say January, or by offsetting it by taking the opposite position uh, and in January, buying the long side at the price of negative 1,000, and then you've exactly uh, locked in your profit, right? Because that long index that you just bought will exactly cover the payments that you're obligated for uh, on the short side, um, and, uh, and you've got the difference of, um, you know, $7 a year per, per year for two years. Totally risk-free. So um, that's the way this would work. Um, and, and actually did work for a few people that actually traded it back then. That's why these, these quotes uh, were going on. Uh, Market is the agency that uh, compiles the quotes from the dealers. At that time, there were six or seven dealers that were trading the NACREF index. A number of them, you know, went by the wayside, actually, <laughs> during, this, during this period even here. Um, but there are still today about three dealers that are, do have an active desk to trade the NACREF index. I'm not saying there's a lot of actual trading going on now. Uh, this is, these things were just in the inception of getting started when the financial crisis hit and when all the issues with derivatives, um, you know, arose. And these are real issues and they need to be solved. And part of the effort of the Dodd-Frank Act is to help um, get the framework, the structure for trading these kinds of products, these derivatives, all sorts of derivatives, uh, in a much more sound footing than it had been prior to that. Uh, and I think that as we work through the implementation of the Dodd-Frank Act, um, we will get that industry back on its feet uh, in a much stronger, more solid way than it was before so that people really will be able to, to do this kind of thing. Um, I Mike or whoever's keeping track of me, don't hesitate to cut me off if I'm running over, but I've lost, totally lost track of the, the time <laughs> here. But um, ju just to show you that, um, that this is, is a real thing, um, these derivatives took off uh, quicker and more substantially in the UK, based on that other index I was telling you about, the uh, Investment Property Data Bank. And um, here's a hedge fund that was set up specifically um, to be a real estate hedge fund and to use, among other devices, to use the trading of derivatives. Uh, and that primarily, they, this is like a, a UK-based thing. This is primarily using the UK uh, index. Um, as well as you know, publicly traded uh, UK property companies and direct pr 
private funds to, um, to engage in a um, in classical hedge fund kind of strategy of trying to protect themselves against the downside but also uh, take advantage of some upside. Um, this, this fund was set up in um, uh, early 2007, right? Remember that time? It was like the peak. And um, so most real estate funds that were set up in 2007, you'd probably think they had, had, have had a pretty rough go of it. Well, here's the, and I don't, I'm not, I don't have any money <laughs> in this fund or anything, so this is just, they send me their information because they know I'm interested in derivatives. Um, but um, this is, um, this is uh, the, the performance record of this iceberg fund. Um, so since uh, the inception of the fund in June of 2007, uh, this is through last December, 2010. Really tough period to make money in real estate investment. Um, for example, um, the black line here is the NACREF index, which being an appraisal-based index, and this is total return, so this includes dividends paid out or rent paid out and reinvested. Um, so you, if you started with $100 in the NACREF index, it's, it's a smooth and lagged kind of index. It's appraisal-based, so it would have appeared that you made a little bit of money all the way in deep into 2008, but actually that's just a, a lagged effect. And actually, you even through through 2010, even with some of the recovery that's happened, you're still underwater. Uh, the NARIT index actually plunged. If you put $100 in the NARIT index in June 2007, by February, March 2009, you had less than $40 left, including the dividends. So um, that's bad news. However, great spectacular recovery in REITs since then. Uh, but you're still underwater today. Um, the transaction base, the TBI, so actual transaction prices um, uh, of the same properties that's tracked by that black 